Let's turn to Psalm 16. Psalm 16 has as a title a Michtam of David. A Michtam. Michtam is a word that's um, related to a word meaning to cover. It's like covering the lips or speaking in secrecy. It makes this a secret or a silent prayer. And it reminds us of uh, Jesus' words in Matthew 6, in uh, verse 6, where he says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. It is secret, it's private. And it's a beautiful psalm showing how uh, David uh, found peace and gladness in difficult times. And um, as we can see in the schematic, um, the first half of the psalm um, speaks about uh, David or David's confidence in God. Um, and then the second half speaks about the benefits uh, of this confidence in God. What, is it, what does it bring? What is the result of it? Um, so we begin um, with the first part, David's confidence in God. Um, and we begin, of course, with verse 1, where he writes, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Preserve me. The call for preservation shows that this was written in times of trouble. But it's not a call in desperation. David declares right away in the same sentence that he trusts the Lord. So he's not desperate um, that he's totally lost what to do or where to turn. Later he will even state in verse 8 that he shall not be moved. And in verse 10 even that he trusts in a life after death. It's not that kind of uh, despair, um, or actually it's not despair at all, that um, makes him to say, preserve me. But he needed preservation, as all of us do. We need preservation from this world that is totally against God. We need preservation from ourselves, our own, uh, our old nature. And we need preservation from the devil and his demons that are after our soul. We need preservation from evil. He continues then in verse 2. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my, God, my Lord. My goodness extended not to thee. David speaks here to his own soul and reflects on what his soul told the Lord. It's like having a little conversation with himself. And we see this in, in different psalms that David does this. And it's good to speak things to our own soul. Um, an, another example of this uh, is in Psalm 42, verse 5. There um, David writes, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou not in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. It's a very interesting process that we see here. Because we all know this um, times that we feel um, a bit down, uh, troubled. And um, we might not come to this thought to speak to our own soul. Why? Why, Why are you troubled? Do you not hope and trust in God? And we should talk to ourselves like that in those times and then, of course, turn to God. He speaks uh, back to Psalm 16 about what his soul says or said to the Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. And that is a good and a true statement. And it's something we should realize and remind ourselves of um, often. Our goodness is a gift from God. And it should be aimed at God. It is of no value without God. He continues then in verse 3. But to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. David delighted in the people of God. And this is something that's often failing among believers. 
Instead of delight, there is negativity, criticism, envy, etc. Yes, of course, our brethren have their shortcomings, their failings even, their scandals. But at the same time, we should see and delight in their excellence that they have in the Lord. Are they not our brethren? Do you not love them? Do you want to be with them in their company, have fellowship? Those who love the Lord will love the company of those who also love him. Having said that, of course, we should always discern who is actually our brother or sister. For there are many impostors. I would call them sinos, eh? Christians in name only. There are many. And so discernment is, of course, required. He continues in verse, verse 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The life of a Christian may not always be easy. It may be full of hardships even. But those who live for another God will find more sorrow. If not now, then certainly in the end. David says they will multiply their sorrows. And these are the very same words that God spoke to Eve after the fall. And it shows what fallenness and godliness does to what it leads. In Genesis 3 verse 16 we read, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt I bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I will greatly multiply, multiply thy sorrow. The same words. That is fallenness. The idol worshippers, they will even offer, offer blood to their gods, which are nothing other than demons. And that was far from David. He, didn't even, he did not even want to mention their names. We read about the priests of Baal and how they offered their own blood in an attempt to please their God and make fire come down. Failed attempt, of course. But blood is offered and drunken in occult and satanic circles. And blood is even offered sometimes among Catholic and Muslims as part of self-chastisement. This is not what God desires. Verse 5. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a good heritage. There is indeed nothing good to be expected from false gods, but David declares that he received only good from the Lord. The Lord was his inheritance, and it should be ours. If we think of David's situation, he had seven brothers, uh, older brothers. So his earthly inheritance would be close to nothing. Yet God made him king. But more than that, he had an eternal inheritance. A good, the best inheritance. The words that David uses reflect the promise of God given to the priests. If we read uh, Numbers 18 verse 20 there it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. That separation of the priests was a type of the separation of the church from the world. David understood that it applied to him too. It is not something uh, that applies to an elite circle of priests that have this special inheritance. That's not what God meant. Uh, this is a type. And Peter confirms this um, later in 1 Peter 2 verse 5 where he says, says speaking to the church you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ you are a holy priesthood he confirms the priesthood is actually a type of the church 
And of course we read several times, also in the book of Revelation, that um, um, the church is uh, priests eh, to, to, uh, to the Lord, are priests to the Lord. This completes actually the, the picture, eh, the typology. Uh, of course, we refer to that in other messages uh, in, in the past, that um, if you put this next to the book of Hebrews, we see that there Jesus is called the high priest, the eternal high priest. So you have the eternal high priest as the head of the church, and then you have the priests as the church. And so this inheritance, this special inheritance of which Numbers speaks, that is for the priests, is what uh, David also recognized. This is the special inheritance that God has for his people, for the church. And he says then, the lines that measure out my inheritance, they have fallen into good places. It's like the, the lines that were set out to measure the, uh, the land that was to be inherited. They fall into pleasant, good and pleasant places. So now uh, David continues to speak about the, the benefits of the confidence in God, the confidence that he has. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the, in the night seasons. Yes, God gives counsel. He gives direction. He gives guidance. David acknowledges that. And it is good to praise him for that. David was so much filled with God that even at night his heart would instruct him in the ways of God. Verse 8 then. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Interesting here is that David says, I have set. I have set. This means and testifies of a deliberate decision that he had made to put God first in his life. And this is a great example to us. This is the ultimate decision we must all make. Without God in the center, which is only possible through Jesus, the way, the only way, without that our life is lost. But with him on the throne, there is security. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. He continues, verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. rejoiceth. Next to counsel and security that he mentioned before, which are incalculable, there is also joy and glory. The decision to set the Lord before you in everything does not result in a gloomy, boring life. Sure, it has costs. David knew all about that. But there is gladness and glory too. Jesus tells us to count the costs, because there are costs, certain pleasures, family relationships, friends, life goals, career. By the way, these are all earthly inheritances. It's nothing compared to the benefits which carry an eternal weight. Then, verse 9, the second half. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It's again one of these profound interjections that David gives, uh, which shows that he was, um, uh, he had a clear understanding of the eternal consequences of the decision to set the Lord always before him. He had secured hope, he had confidence that God would not leave his soul in the grave, but that he would be granted eternal life. And so, to us, this may be self-evident, but in the Old Testament uh, era, this understanding was at best cloudy. To us, it is fully revealed. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Verse 10, the second half, then, <clears throat> is um, something, again, that is extremely profound. Here, we actually find a prophecy of Jesus. 
It says, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It's really profound. Of course, uh, in the context, um, David was referring to the preservation of his own soul. But um, you may notice that holy one is capitalized. And that is done for a good reason. Now, I have to uh, say right away that in the original text there are no capital letters. Actually, Hebrew and also the, uh, the Greek uh, up until some uh, few hundred years ago didn't have any um, capital letters. The Hebrew still doesn't. So everywhere where you see cap uh, capitalization in the Bible, this is added in the translation. Um, but um, even so, that is done here for a reason. Because this is really a prophecy about Jesus, the only man in who, in who indeed there is no corruption, or who did not see corruption. This is not conjecture that it's about Jesus, but um, this is um, by the Holy Spirit perceived and declared on the day of Pentecost by Peter. And we can read about that in Acts 2, verse 25 through 31. So again, we are in the day of Pentecost, and it is Peter who speaks here. And he quotes the second half of, from verse 8 to the end of Psalm 16 as follows. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Peter then continues, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulture is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So Peter makes here a direct um, link between the words of Psalm 16 and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, he is actually saying uh, that this is a prophecy about Jesus. Though Jesus bore our sins, he remained the Holy One, even in his death. And this proves that he was without sin, without corruption. Death could not hold him, is what Peter says just preceding this uh, quote, in, uh, actually in Acts 2, verse 24. Death could not hold him, and therefore resurrection was inevitable. And it proves and confirms the perfectness and completeness of Jesus' work on the cross. The depth of this statement here in Psalm 16 by David should not be overlooked or underestimated. It's really profound. He closes then um, with verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The final words of this psalm are full of confidence. Confidence that the benefits of a life that is committed to God are to be received in this life and in the life beyond. The path of life extends beyond death. Eternal life begins here. The path of life we walk now already knows the presence of God. But that presence will become more immediate when experienced at his right hand. And they will continue forevermore. The right hand is the place of favor, of honor, security, dignity, of nobility, even of strength. That is the place that God has for his children, not the left-handed place. 
And notice that Peter includes this last verse in the psalm when he links it to Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Jesus now sits at the right hand of the throne. And he promised, where I go, you know. And the way, you know. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And this call will come soon. Amen.